everyone. Hello. Uh, I am in Las Vegas where we went to the U2 concert last night at the Sphere. It was amazing. Uh, but that's not why I'm coming to you live. I know it's Saturday, so uh, it's nine o'clock where I am. Thank you all for joining us. I wanted to do an Instagram live with someone I really respect, a former ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall, who's also a professor at Stanford. Hi, everyone. Um, I thought it was really important for us to understand what's going on in Ukraine and what the ramifications are of not sending aid to Ukraine. Mike McFall just got back from the Munich Security Conference. He was a very close friend of Alexei Navalny, and I thought he, we'd get a quick update from Mike. It's so important. Yeah, it's nine o'clock where I am. I know it's early to be doing this, but this is so important, everyone, and that's why I wanted to have this conversation with uh, someone who is an expert in this area. And yes, we should do another Instagram Live about what's going on in Gaza and policy in Israel. But let me get, today we're talking about Russia, but thank you for that suggestion. So let me get to Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Katie, how are you? I'm good. good. Thanks so much for doing this. You know, I've been really anxious to talk to you uh, ever since, well, so much has gone on with aid to Ukraine, the death of your good friend. Uh, is it Alexei? How do I pronounce uh, uh, Navalny's first name? Because I've heard it different ways. That's right. Alexei. Alexei. That's exactly right. Alexei yeah. Navalny. And I know you two were very close. So I wanted to basically just do an update for people. I should probably just give a quick update on what the situation in Ukraine is, Mike. More than 14 million Ukrainians have been forced to flee their homes since the start of the war two years ago today. You and I had a conversation that morning, actually, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Nearly 6.5 million people are living outside the country as refugees. An estimated 3.7 million people are displaced. In uh, a report on Thursday, the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine said it had verified 10,582 civilian deaths, 19,875 wounded civilians, but those numbers are significantly higher, 587 children killed. Um, so, Mike, let's just start by talking about, and by the way, if you want to look up Mike's CV, he's got a million things that he does, including he's a teacher at Professor of Political Science at Stanford, uh, but we're really talking to him because he is the former U.S. ambassador to Russia, knows Putin, understands him, and uh, it's just an expert in this part of the world. So right now, things are not good in Ukraine in terms of what's happening on the ground militarily, Mike. Can you explain? Uh, yeah, well, thanks for having me. Good to see nice you. To see and it is you. a tragic day that we're meeting. And of course, we're front and center in that. Uh, we, the United States, that uh, the president, uh, President Biden, uh, proposed an aid package, a big one, but uh, the biggest chunk of it was 50 billion in military assistance to Ukraine, another 10 billion in economic assistance. Uh, that passed the House. Uh, I excuse me. That passed the Senate mm -hmm. uh, rather easily. Um, and everybody I talked to, including members of Congress, uh, Republican members of Congress, last week say that if that bill would go to the floor, it would pass easily. Uh, there is support, this, this notion that there's not support uh, in Congress or the American people for that matter is just factually incorrect. And we should I, just, I just wanna interject for two seconds, Mike, to explain for people who may have not followed this closely, House Speaker Mike Johnson, uh, he decided to uh, recess the House without bringing this bill to the floor, um, which I can imagine only created worlds of consternation for people at the conference, but also for people who understand how dire the situation is in Ukraine. How frustrated are they? Because basically Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, is not bringing it to the floor because Donald Trump told him not to. It's like, what? Tragically, I think it's just that simple. And in a minute, maybe we can talk about some 
ways to get around that, but the world is frustrated. I mean, uh, Zelensky himself in his speech in Munich said, dictators don't go on vacation. Uh, that was a phrase in his um, uh, speech. Uh, we looked, I mean, I, I have to tell you honestly, Katie, I felt embarrassed to be an American at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, the scenarios that people, the Ukrainians talked about were dire and all we need to do is send them ammunition. They're not asking us to fight on their behalf. They're just asking for ammunition, right? Re kind of remember that. Um, this is a good deal for the American people. Uh, this is not, this is not, uh, it's good for us to weaken the, the Russian army in Ukraine so that it doesn't get stronger and begin to threaten our NATO allies. And there were many people from our NATO allies, from Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, at this conference. And I was in Lithuania the month before. Uh, and what they worry about is, yes, Russia is having a hard time in Ukraine now, but they're investing to make their army stronger. Putin is a dictator. He can move assets from the commercial side into the military side. And they worry two, three, four years from now, uh, next stop will be their countries. And, and, you know, lots of analogies in Munich about the 1930s, right? When Hitler, you know, slowly got stronger, slowly took territory, then he invaded Poland in 1939. And even in that event, Americans were saying, not our problem, that war's far away. And we know how that ended tragically in 1941. So their plea was, learn from history, Americans, wake up, uh, get out of your isolationist stupor and help us defeat Putin now in Ukraine so that American soldiers two to three years from now won't be having to fight Putin in Poland. And what is motivating people like Donald Trump and, and others who are falling in line? What is their rationale for not delivering aid to Ukraine? Because it's quite hard to understand for a lot of people. I'd love to hear your perspective on that, Mike. Well, it's always hard for me to understand the logic of Mr. Trump, uh, even though I followed his career for a long time. Um, uh, I mean, initially, just to back up a bit, initially they said, we can't have aid to Ukraine without border security, right? Uh, we're being invaded from the South, so we gotta do, we gotta do that together. And so the Senate, a right. coalition, uh, as a Republican and independent and Democrat, uh, worked for months to come up with a compromise deal to do that. And everybody applauded them. Uh, and then Trump said, basically, you know, basically said, we can't have new money for border security because I want that problem to fester until my election. I don't want Biden to show that he's making uh, progress. I want it. So I want to go into the election saying he's done nothing. And so he killed that one. Then they took it out and they passed it through the Senate. And, and right now, to the best of my understanding, um, you mean they separated the Ukraine and Israel aid yeah. from the border security? Yes. Issue. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. I went too fast. Uh, then they took that out. Um, and it seems to me that there is just a minority group in the Republican Party that doesn't want, that thinks we shouldn't have any aid to Ukraine. They're, you know, America firsters. Uh, they say it's not our war. Um, but tragically, one of them is uh, Mr. Trump. That's what he believes. Well, it's not only the attitude that it's not our war, it's cozying up to Russia and Putin in a way yes. that is quite uh, disturbing, to say the least. And that is another thing that people are, are scratching their heads about. I mean, I think it's a whole confluence of things. It could be the anti-woke uh, philosophy of Vladimir Putin in terms of transgender rights and things that the extreme right feel very threatened by. But there are other things going on as well, correct? Yeah, you're right. There has been for many years now in America. Uh, it started even when I was ambassador. I remember we would get these groups, these evangelical groups from the United States coming to meet with the Russian Orthodox Church uh very strange right uh and and then guys like pat buchanan if you remember him oh, right? he had yeah. a, a kind of isolationist view at home and he was pro putin uh in terms of his 
worldview, right? This kind of uh, illiberal, orthodox, uh, anti-LGBT rights. So, you know, that's what Mr. Putin's like. And there are people, it's an ideological affinity. That's exactly right, what you just said. It is there. Uh, and in many ways, uh, it's not just in Russia and the United States, by the way. It's it's in Hungary, Viktor Orban. It's, there, there's elements of it in Italy and France and Serbia. Uh, and in many ways, that those ideological soulmates, I call it the illiberal international, but, but you know, just these populist nationalists, uh, conservative with these alleged conservative values. I, I don't like the way they appropriate that word because mm -hmm. I don't think it's conservative to do things that Putin's doing. Um, but, but, you know, in many ways, Orban, Putin and Trump share more ideologically than I do with Mr. Trump, even though Mr. Trump and I are Americans, right? So that is definitely going on. And with Trump in particular, as you rightly uh, 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 noted, he has had an obsession with Putin ever since he first ran for president. He never criticizes him. Uh, just last week, he said, if they don't pay us to protect them, then, you know. If NATO Putin doesn't. Yeah, if NATO doesn't pay, uh, if NATO doesn't pay us to protect them, by the way, just to be clear, that's not how NATO works. It's not a protection racket, but that's, I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of what uh, Trump said. Then we're not going to protect them and Putin should just invade them. And Russia, that's what he said. basically he said Russia can do whatever the hell it wants. That's exactly what he said. Thank you for remembering the phrase, whatever the hell he wants. And that just is, I don't know, it's just outrageous uh, because... And I don't need to say why it's outrageous. We all agree it's outrageous, but that is a factor too. And that's why another factor, Putin, Trump has never wanted to provide aid to Ukraine. Um, you know, he got impeached the first time because he tried to coerce the Ukrainians uh, to find alleged dirt on the Bidens in, in return for that aid. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the story. It's his, his allegiance to Putin uh, is part of the story why he's blocking aid to Ukraine. You say of Speaker Johnson, if he continues to block this vote, his place in our history books will be an embarrassing one, like the isolationists and American firsters in the 1930s who wrongly argued that giving aid to Great Britain did not serve American interests and Hitler's war in Europe was not our problem. Um, it sounds to me like you believe Speaker Johnson, if he does not at least bring this a package to a vote will have blood on his hands. And you are suggesting, Mike, an alternative. Can you explain that quickly about how how Congress could potentially get around Mike Johnson's uh, refusal to vote on this? Yeah, well, but first, for anybody listening that, that is in his district or knows anybody in his district, please express your views, because I, I think he knows that it's the right thing to do. He's just worried about Trump and he's worried about that small MAGA faction in his party that will vote to, to vacate the office if he lets this go to the floor and he'll have the same fate as uh, Speaker McCarthy. And, and you know, I, I worked in Washington for, for three years, five years in the government. Uh, what good is power to have if you don't use it to do the right thing? Like, I look at Speaker Johnson and, you know, I'm not an expert on American electoral politics, but I have a lot of friends who are. You know, at most, he's probably going to be there till January. Um, use that power to do the right thing. Don't go down in history as the person that, that blocked this. And by the way, if he blocks this, the war is going to look a lot worse come November than it looks today. And yes, I don't even understand the electoral strategy. Uh, if this war is raging and Putin is, is on the move and they blocked aid to Ukraine, how is that going to help them win elections, well, especially with Ukrainian Americans in Pennsylvania and Polish Americans in Michigan? I, I used to work with those groups in the 2008 election. There's no way this is going to be good for them. But I, you're right. I, I, thanks for uh, quoting my piece. I have a get out of jail free card for uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, uh, to, uh, to oversimplify it, there's we rightly froze Russian assets when uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. Uh, billions of them, like 30 billion of them, right? This is money that their central bank uh, keeps safely in our banks because, uh, you know, and buys our treasury bills. Uh, my, I, there's new legislation now, and it's passed 
out of the committees in both the House and Senate to mandate, to pressure, you know, to require the president to now give those monies to the Ukrainians in a, in a relief fund. I think it's a fantastic idea because um, uh, there's no way any American president is ever going to give that money back. Like, think of how absurd that would be. Uh, now that the war's over, we're going to give them their billions back. That's not going to happen. So my idea for Speaker Johnson is to bring those two pieces of legislation together. Uh, this happens all the time in Congress, right? Marry them together, uh, make that an amendment to the aid package. And then he could say to the American people, you know, I took it to the Biden administration because they're not, by the way, the Biden administration is split on this legislation. They're, they're worried about the dollar. They're worried about the stability of the ec uh, liberal economic order. Uh, our, you know, uh, whether we're good to buy uh, treasury bonds. I get it. I, I've had many, many conversations with them, but I think they're wrong. So he could claim I took it to them uh, by, with this legislation and I pressured the Europeans to do the same, right? Because they're always talking about the Europeans need to do more. They have the vast majority of these assets. And if we pass this thing, it's called the Repo Act, uh, with the aid bill, that would put pressure on Europeans. So I think this is a, a way that uh, Speaker Johnson can make history. Do you think he ha would have the balls to do that, though, if he hasn't brought it to the floor at all? I mean, I think you're giving him a lot of credit. And how would Trump feel about that legislation, Mike? I don't know. Uh, you're, you're right. I don't know Speaker Johnson personally. Uh, I, I know he's going to get a copy of my piece. Uh, so I'm told by a friend. So I hope he'll consider it. And um, like I said, like fearing Trump for how long? Like you're, you literally uh, might be removed in a week if you let this fall, uh, go to the floor. I got it. But you only got a few more months left, Speaker. I mean, really, uh, do you really want to go down in history as the guy that rewarded Putin as he slaughters Ukrainians? And let's be clear, he's not just killing soldiers, he's slaughtering civilians that don't have the air defenses because they've run out of interceptors. And he just killed Alexei Navalny, for God's sakes. This guy is a cold-blooded killer. Why do you want to be the, the, the American that history books will write about that rewarded Vladimir Putin. I know that the Biden administration announced a new set of, of sanctions against Russia as a result of Navalny's death. Julia Yaffe described the, or told me that some people describe the Russian economy, Mike, as a cockroach economy. It's, it's, it's unbelievably resilient and can handle a lot of these sanctions. Do you think there it's enough? How will it impact? How will they impact the Russian economy? And what else could be done? So I applaud the Biden administration for the sanctions package. I, I run a international working group on sanctions, uh, and we've been proposing all kinds of ideas uh, for two years now. By the way, this idea of giving the assets to Ukraine, we wrote that paper in October 2012. Um, uh, so. So the way I always think about it on sanctions is that's great what you did today. Uh, what are you going to do tomorrow? Uh, we have a in two incremental approach to sanctions. Um, and, and before I get into the criticism, not only do I applaud the sanctions yesterday, but, but generally speaking, the, in my view, sanctions are designed to reduce Putin's ability to conduct his war in Ukraine. It's not going to change his mind. This idea we're going to sanction the oligarchs and then the oligarchs are going to tell Vladimir, hey, Vladimir, we're, we're losing a lot of money. You got to end this war. That's not the way that system works. But we can reduce his resources and sanctions have. Let's be clear about that. It, not enough, but, uh, you know, they have $100 billion less today than they would have had uh, because of the energy sanctions. They are uh, uh, do not have the same technologies today that they would have had uh, had we not put in place sanctions. So, th and they are working, and by the way, on individuals, because I, I get calls from them every every week. Uh, uh, when people say sanctions don't matter, they haven't talked to people on the, the list. It matters a lot to them. Um, but, it, you know, we just got to do more. We just got to please do more. Uh, you know, I, I compare it to parking tickets here at Stanford. I don't know what it's like where you live, but, uh, because uh, I just got one recently, you, you get a parking ticket on the first day that you're illegally parked. 
But if you leave your car there, you get another one on the second day. You don't just get one parking ticket for seven days of being wrongly parked. Uh, you get one every single day. It ratchets up every single day. And every single day that Putin's army is illegally parked in Ukraine, there should be new sanctions. One, uh, we, we've gotten some smart questions from people who watch this, which I always appreciate. Someone asked, how is Putin, how, sorry, how is Putin able to stay in power? Um, and can you just address that question for us, Mike? Two things, oil and gas and terror. It's just that simple. So he has means that they just come out of the earth, right? He doesn't have to create companies that are effective. Uh, he has enough means because of the richness of their resources to stay in power. Um, by the way, he's destroyed a lot of their great companies, right? They, they had this company called Yandex that was kind of the Google of, of Russia, created from scratch from really smart you know, entrepreneurs. Uh, he, he destroyed them uh, because of sanctions and because you know, he just took it over and he put his thugs in place. Uh, but the, ba the real part is terror. Uh, he just killed Alexei Navalny. Um, if you're a pro if you're thinking about protesting against him, uh, you're going to be more fearful as a result of that. Uh, and within his own uh, operation, right? I, I study uh, revolutions and I study democrac democratization generally. I teach courses on that here at Stanford. So this, you know, there's lots of ways that uh, dictatorships end. Um, one is a ground, you know, uh, protest from below, but that's very dangerous in Putin's Russia. Sometimes you get splits within the regime, right? Uh, and generals that overthrow them. And you had a, a threat of that in Russia last summer, this guy, Mr. Prigozhin. Right. Uh, but then it failed. Uh, and then a few weeks later, they shot his plane out of the air. They killed him. Um, so terror is a big part of this. And one of my colleagues here at Stanford just, just on Friday released it, uh, a big study of, of terror, basically terrorism, how many people were killed and jailed for political reasons. Uh, in Putin's Russia, it's much more severe than the Khrushchev period and Brezhnev period of the Soviet Union. Not as bad as Stalin yet, but it's significantly worse than those those uh, those Soviet leaders. So that's how he's staying in power so far. And you mentioned terror. People are are terrified that any sign of objecting to the regime. For example, he arrested a woman who gave fifty dollars to a yes. Ukrainian charity. There was, I think, a woman in her seventies who posted something about the war on social media, who was arrested. I mean. It, 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 it doesn't take much for people, for any kind of resistance to be, you know, squashed. That's right. That said, I, I also want to remind uh, everybody watching and listening that there are some incredibly brave, courageous Russians, millions of them, not tens of them, who do not uh, support this totalitarian dictatorship. Uh, many of them have to live abroad now, including Alexei Navalny's widow, who I just saw yesterday. She's, she's visiting her daughter here at Stanford. Uh, they, but they have a, a big organization. They are popular. Uh, their people on media have giant audiences, even when it's dangerous to listen to them. And there are also millions of Russians that are not brave enough to go on the streets to protest Navalny's uh, murder, although hundreds did, by the way. Uh, but the vast majority, because of terror, they're afraid of him. But don't ever for a minute confuse that with support for Putin. Uh, I think this regime is actually quite fragile. Why, why did he have to kill the Navalny? I mean, think about it. Strong leaders don't have to do that. Strong leaders don't have to arrest ballerinas who give $50 donations for a relief fund in Ukraine. Those are signs of weakness and paranoia. Um, and I think, I, I can't, we're not good at predicting when these things happen. And by the way, I worked five years in the government and the CIA is not good at predicting them either. Let me just remind everybody of that. But uh, after Putin is no longer ruling Russia, uh, whether he dies or is incapacitated, I don't think this regime is very strong. I think the possibility for breakthrough is is rather great you know
One of our viewers uh, reminded me, and I wanted to mention this because this was breaking news this morning, that Navalny's body was finally released to his mother um, after, I guess, a lot of negotiations. Um, do you want to talk isn't a little that, bit? Isn't that yeah, just so that. weird? I guess they were saying it must be a private burial or a prison burial. Yeah. I guess they did not want his funeral or uh, burial to get international attention yes. and help galvanize anti-Putin sentiment, right? Just, just so sick. I mean, I was with his his family yesterday while they were, you know, with Dasha's grandmother negotiating about this and. You know, she's there alone, basically. You know, she doesn't have, you know, her family can't be with her. They literally cannot go to bury their husband or their father. It's just, and then they did this, just, just it, the level of evil of this man, I think we have underappreciated for a long time. And that they did that to her. Thankfully, they resolved it, but it, it was horrible. You know, what they, the, the, the kinds of choices they were forcing her to make yesterday. Let, um, let's just talk for a minute, then I'm going to let you go, Mike. You're so nice to do this on a Saturday morning. But I got to go speak, actually, Katie. I got to go speak at a rally that our students are doing. Uh, our courageous Ukrainian students uh, who have been fantastic here, they're, they're, they're doing a big uh, remembrance of this day. So uh, I'm going to run to that next, and then I'll go see the Navalny's after that. Well, but I'm, it's always good to be with you. Yeah. Well well, I think your insight is invaluable. And I, again, I appreciate it so much. I'm just curious, sort of to wrap things up about the timing of Navalny's murder. Why did it happen? Was it tied to the Munich Security Conference? Was it tied to this aid to Ukraine controversy that's going on in Washington? You know Putin, you've spent time with him. I'm curious if you can help uh, uh, sort of illuminate what his mindset was and continues to be at this moment in time. Right. So I don't know, but I can get maybe a better guess than most, right? Because I have known him for a long time. I met him in 91, dealt with him in the government and have written and followed his career, obviously. Uh, and I was in Munich. Um, uh, he gave a very famous speech there. His last big speech that he gave there was in 2007. And that was basically the pivot. That's when he went off the deep end. And every, you know, scholars write about it that this was a very pivotal moment where he broke with the West. Um, by the way, I, I was with his, uh, Yulia, I was with Yulia the night before uh, Putin killed her husband. And um, uh, we were planning to meet to talk about her daughter's graduation, by the way. Uh, um, and then she called me that morning. Um, uh, when you were in Munich. Yeah. Uh, to say uh, she just wanted to make sure her daughter was okay. And so she wanted me to reach out to my wife here at Stanford and, and she was all business, you know, uh, we got to deal with this. And then she gave this incredibly moving speech at Munich. I urge your, your, everybody watching to go find it. It was talk about a tough principled woman. Um, uh, but, but I tell you all that cause that's all, yeah, yeah exactly. This theory was this on purpose. Uh, to be timed uh, wouldn't surprise me because Putin likes these things. He times things uh, on these kinds of ways. Um, they killed what, a journalist uh, a long time ago on a, his birthday. And so uh, Anna Politkovska was her name. But I think the real thing to know about the timing is that Putin just doesn't care about us anymore. He thinks we're weak and he thinks he can do do whatever he damn well pleases, and he's daring us to stop him. I think this, he, he took pleasure in, in torturing uh, Alexei. Uh, when I was in Munich the night before he was killed, uh, I learned from Yulia, it was horrible, the conditions he was living in, absolutely horrible. Can you describe did, them? Well, first, you know, they moved him around and then they finally moved him to this, you know, the end of the earth in the North Pole, Siberia. It was a one room cell, you know, he could barely walk in it. Um, uh, it's freezing cold. They would not, this notion he was taking a walk outside. They say, no, it was in a, it was just in another jail cell with an open roof. Uh, that was the only space. He was given one book. Uh, they would pipe in Putin's speeches into his cell. Uh, he had no access to radio or TV or electronics. Uh, they cut off 
the, the letter writing. He used to write letters, of course, through his lawyers uh, to his uh, family. I even got letters from time to time from him in, in jail. They cut that off. Uh, it was pretty, you know, starving him. Uh, they were torturing him. Um, but then Putin, I just think he, he wanted to say, you know, I, I can do this because I'm Vladimir Putin and I dare you weak people in the West uh, to do anything about it. And that I think is his mentality. And that's why people make a grave mistake if they think he's not gonna continue, uh, that they, he won't threaten a NATO country. There's no doubt in my mind that, uh, that if God forbid uh, he prevails in Ukraine, uh, he will strengthen his army and he will test us in places like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Because he, he is, he is, that is the mentality he's in. He thinks he's been called by God to take on the West. Uh, and the, the only way we're gonna stop him is by arming those soldiers in Ukraine. Uh, that's the only language he understands is force. No negotiation, no talking is gonna have any effect on him. And, and, and just in, in closing, how much is time of the essence, Mike? I think people are asking, and I'm curious, I mean, are we at a, a crucial tipping point in terms of getting aid to the Ukrainians, the longer we wait. In other words, how much time do we have before Russia takes, really takes over Ukraine if they don't get the aid that is being stalled on Capitol Hill? It's of the essence. Uh, Avdika, a city that Ukraine has hold, held for two years, just fell. Uh, the, the sense I get is we're, it's about weeks and months, not years, if they don't get this aid. Um, and, you know, in war, when you have momentum, things can go fast, right? It's been at a stalemate for a long time. But if there is a breakthrough, um, uh, you know, Ukrainians worry about two of the most major cities in Ukraine, Kharkiv and Odessa. You know, they could be taken or under siege by the time we get around to our elections. So it, it, this is a absolutely critical moment. So if you could do anything, if anybody's on this call that knows Speaker Johnson, uh, ask him to do the right thing. He, you know, he always talks about that he's, uh, you know, Christian and he's following the Bible for what he does. Well, Alexei was a Christian. He was a devout Christian. Um, uh, and he was slaughtered by these KGB people that have nothing to do with uh, uh, Christianity. I met lots of uh, warriors last week. They all had their crosses on, these Ukrainian warriors. Uh, I'm, I'm just scratching, you know, I'm looking for any argument. Uh, you know, if you can't do the right thing in terms of US policy, do the right thing in terms of Christian values. Uh, but anything anybody can do to break this, uh, this passage. Uh, this I guess block. people could call his Absolutely. office, you know. They, you know I remember and interviewing Mark Kelly and, and he was saying that people pay attention when people actually call congressional offices. So maybe on Monday, people can, who are listening to this can call his office and urge him to act. That's exactly right. I have many friends in Congress and people wonder if it matters. It matters. Uh, they watch that stuff. So that's a great note to end on. Don't just watch this tragedy. You can do something to try to end it. This craven desire to maintain power has usurped not only domestic politics, but now sort of global security. It's just, uh, it's a really sad state of affairs. And I'll never forget what you told me at the beginning of this conversation at the Munich Security Conference. I was embarrassed to be an American. Yeah. You, I love America. I proudly served our country abroad. One of the greatest things in my life was to be able to represent our country. But I, this time around, I just, I felt that deeply. And we've got to end that because that, let me just end on one other note. Uh, oh my God, I'm really late. I just, okay, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. I want to end on this note. Uh, uh, um, it's not just embarrassing. If we don't step up, this will come back to haunt us. That we cannot, superpowers don't get to retire. If we pull back, the Chinese and the Iranians and the Russians and North Koreans, they're all aligned, they're all helping each other. If we, as the most powerful country in the free world, pull back, we will face a really messy world. And, and one day, it'll come back to drag us in, as many people in Munich said, 
as in World War III. And don't believe me, just read the lessons of the 1930s. So if you don't believe it on the moral side, it's in our own national interest to do the right thing now so that we don't face these much more dire consequences two or three years down the road. All right, Mike, I'll let right. you go again. Thanks so much. Thanks Appreciate it. You All appreciate right. your time. Take care. Right. Thanks Bye -bye. for watching, everyone.